February is Black History Month, and my new book, Immortal Valor, about the Black Medal of Honor recipients of World War II, is out now. The book chronicles these immortal heroes' life journeys through all the pain and struggle up until their ultimate triumphs. I hope you check out the book to discover more as we celebrate Black History Month. Just visit my website at robchild.net or visit any online retailer. Welcome to Canada in the Great War, our two-part podcast series that brings to life the rise of innovative General Sir Arthur Currie and the Canadian Corps' spearhead in the last 100 days of World War I. I'm Robert Child, and I hope you enjoy the program. Canada in the Great War, written by Robert Child, narrated by Colin McLean. The Last 100 Days it was over in just 93 minutes, but the Australian and American-led victory three days after Dominion Day at Le Hamel had raised the confidence of Generals Ferdinand Foch and Douglas Haig to plan for another larger offensive before the cold weather set in. On July the 20th, 1918, General Curry was summoned from Arras to General Sir Henry Rawlinson's headquarters near Amiens. Here, he and General John Monash, commander of the Australian forces, were given details of a new Allied objective, the Amiens Offensive. The Allies needed to remove the danger of Germany splitting the French and German armies apart and capturing the important rail supply lines at Amiens. Curry began to devise an intricate plot to deceive the enemy and many of his subordinates. On July the 22nd, General Curry held a conference of divisional commanders to detail his plans for a Canadian attack against Orange Hill, 60 miles to the north. Only a select few of his staff knew that the operation was complete fiction. I was a young officer sitting at the back of the room with nothing to say, but watching it all knowing it was bunk. I was one of three or four officers who knew the real show, it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. I don't know another commander who could have carried the thing off as Curry did. Colonel Andrew McNaughton General Curry, in a final deceptive masterstroke, sent several medical units to Flanders. He knew German soldiers would note the movements of medical personnel, especially Allied nurses. This was a decision that he would later deeply regret as the battle pressed forward. The Canadian Corps would strike the main blow on the British 4th Army's right. The jumping-off line was located just west of the village of Angard. The German line was defined by 20 tired divisions from the 18th Army, von Hutje, and 2nd Army, Marwitz. In the four months since they had captured the salient, the Germans had created a strong defensive system. The Canadian Corps' task on the first day was to capture an intermediate objective the Green Line, located just east of the village of Marcel Cave, and to seize and hold the Red Line, which ran in a northeasterly direction from Mezières, south of the Roi Road, just to the west of Arbonnières. The 2nd Canadian Division, on General Curry's left flank, had as an additional objective the Blue Dotted Line, which angled forward from the Red towards the village of Arbonnières in the Australian sector. The average depth of penetration to capture this objective was eight miles. The terrain consisted of a rolling plateau cut diagonally by the deep valley of the River Luce that was a natural obstacle for advancing troops, especially in the marshy areas. On July the 30th, the main body of the Canadian Corps began to move by train from the Arras area to the concentration area southwest of Amiens. Secrecy continued. Instructions were ordered pasted in every individual's service and pay book under the emphatic heading, Keep Your Mouth Shut. Nothing was left to chance. The misty weather prevented the enemy's observers from detecting the abnormal traffic on the forward roads, yet permitted RAF bombers to fly over the area and act as a noise diversion for the tanks moving into position. Reports of the assembly of British tanks were attributed to phantoms of the imagination or nervousness. On August the 4th, German General Erich Ludendorff issued an order of the day in which he sought to dispel the feeling of apprehension with which many were reported to be viewing the possibility of an Allied offensive. 
We can await every hostile attack with the greatest confidence. As I have already explained, we should wish for nothing better than to see the enemy launch an offensive, which can but hasten the disintegration of his forces. General Erich Ludendorff General Ludendorff would not have to wait much longer. The opening salvo would be fired within four short days. Unlike many previous battles, there would be no preliminary bombardment until zero hour, 4.20 a.m. August the 8th. More than 900 guns were set to fire at that moment, followed quickly by the advance of nearly 600 tanks and 1,900 aircraft, and waves of infantry would begin the march of the last hundred days. As darkness fell on the 7th, a tense air of expectancy consumed the men as they moved into the assembly area. Nine minutes before midnight, Lieutenant Colonel Andrew McNaughton, in his artillery post at ruined Bove Castle, began a letter to his wife. A droll place I am in at the moment, a ruined castle that dates from the Middle Ages. It must have seen some battles in its day, but nothing to what is going to be let loose in a few hours. A south wind blows fresh through the trees of the courtyard, or rather, what was once a courtyard of this castle. There is no moon, but the stars are bright. The troops and tanks must be now pretty well into their battle positions. Very quiet. McNaughton continued, 4.08. Only twelve minutes now. It looks as if our surprise will come off. Many planes over now. 4.20. They are off, well together and on time, all along the front. Long live Canada. A chaplain in the Canadian 21st Battalion describes the scene. At 4.20 to the moment, a blaze of crimson lighted the whole horizon behind us for miles. Three seconds later, there was a deafening roar from hundreds of guns. The shells screamed overhead like countless legions of destroying angels. The concussion resembled the throbbing of an engine built to drive a planet on its course. Captain R.J. Renison, chaplain, 21st Battalion. The surprise attack was like nothing the Germans had ever experienced on the Western Front. Artillery, tanks, men and even cavalry came together in an overwhelming orchestration of military might. By seven o'clock, three Canadian divisions and scores of Mark VI and Mark V tanks were advancing across a fog-shrouded 22,000-yard front, marching in platoon formation and sweeping the enemy from the field. At half-past seven, the 9th Brigade had reached the Green Line. The 49th Battalion, meeting little opposition in its advance across the unfenced fields, reached the Red Line at 10 o'clock. By 1.30pm, there was no longer any organised enemy resistance, though the assaulting companies had still to contend with isolated machine-gun nests on the outer defence line. The arrival of the 7th Battalion at the blue-dotted line completed the 1st Division's task. Everything I feared and of which I had so often given warning had here in one place become a reality. Our war machine was no longer efficient. August the 8th was the black day of the German army. General Erich Ludendorff By the evening of August the 8th, senior staff officers hurried up from GHQ to ask what I thought should be done. The advance had gone far beyond anyone's expectations, and no one seemed to know just what to do. I replied in the Canadian vernacular, The going seems good. Let's go on. General Arthur Curry. Five German divisions had effectively been engulfed. Allied forces pushed, on average, seven miles into enemy territory by the end of that first day. The Canadians had gained eight miles, Australians seven, British two, and the French five miles of penetration. On August the 9th, Canadian forces gained another five miles, and General Curry was forced to move his field headquarters to a quarry near Demois to keep up with his rapidly advancing forces. The quarry location caused many staff officers to complain. Those complaints stopped when Demois was levelled abruptly by German shells. Casualties increased dramatically as the battle pressed forward due to fresh German reinforcements. The front line was far ahead of supplies, 
and General Curry's earlier order to send medical teams north to a fictional battle returned to haunt him. A scene of horror that I shall never forget, with ambulance after ambulance full of wounded men, some shrieking, some groaning, some dying, some dead, some just suffering in patience. Arthur Curry. Field Marshal Foch, encouraged by the Allies' stunning and unanticipated success, kept up the pressure to keep going, but giving no specifics on how to do so. When Field Marshal Douglas Haig visited Curry at his headquarters at Demois on the 9th, Curry was having strong reservations about continuing the offensive. Local attacks took place for the next two days, but were largely ineffective due to the lack of coordination between the infantry and artillery, a factor in the great successes of August the 8th. On August the 13th, General Curry sent a letter to Commander Rawlinson at 4th Army Headquarters, pointing out the difficulties of continuing the assault due to loss of the element of surprise and thousands of yards of uncut wire which needed to be destroyed by artillery. He went further and suggested that the Canadian Corps be taken out of the line to fight in the north, where, as storm troops, they could be equally effective. At 10am, Sir Henry Rawlinson brought a letter which he'd received from General Curry, stating the capture of the positions in question would be a costly matter. Curry was opposed to it. About four o'clock, I was overtaken by an English officer just arrived by aeroplane with a letter from Sir Douglas Haig. The letter reported that German positions at the line were solidly held and that for that reason he decided to postpone the operation. Any postponement of the movement would have the most serious consequences. Therefore, I stated the date agreed upon should be adhered to. Field Marshal Ferdinand Foch I spoke to Foch quite straightly and let him understand that I was responsible for the handling of British forces. Foch's attitude at once changed and he said all he wanted was information of my intentions and thought I was quite correct in my decision not to attack the enemy in his prepared position. Douglas Haig Curry, by this unfolding chain of events, had demonstrated an influence on operations of the entire Western Front theatre. Normally, it would be inconceivable for a corps commander to wield such power, but indeed it was a confirmation of the impact General Curry's tactical assessments had on the conduct of the war. On August the 20th, General Haig ordered the Canadians back to Arras, where General Curry would prepare for his next great challenge, the breaking of the Hindenburg Line. The Hindenburg Line The British Army was confronted with the fact that the Hindenburg Line was in front of them and that no success could have far-reaching results unless that Hindenburg system was broken. Arthur Curry I think the Canadians are the force on which I can rely to clean up between Arras and the Hindenburg Line. That's going to be a long task and a hard one, but the Canadians know that ground so perfectly and they are so determined that I think I can trust them to do so. The Canadian Corps is the ram with which we will break up the last line of defence of the German army. Field Marshal Ferdinand Foch the vast, unbroken 100-mile Hindenburg line stretched from Lens to the Ains River. The fortifications included concrete bunkers and machine gun emplacements, heavy belts of 1,000-yard-deep barbed wire, tunnels for moving troops, deep trenches, dugouts and command posts. At a distance of one kilometre in front of the fortifications was a thinly held outpost line, which would serve a purpose comparable to skirmishers, slowing down and disrupting an enemy advance. Curry, at his headquarters at noyel Villon on August the 23rd, began plans for the battle that would break the back of the German army. His objective, smashing through a section of the Hindenburg Line called the DQ, or the drocourt quayon Line. Before the DQ line lay a succession of ridges, rivers and canals which formed natural lines of defence of great strength along the Arras-Cambrai road. The four main systems of defence consisted of the old German front system east of monchy le preux at Orange Hill, the fresse bouvroy line, the drocourt quayon line and the Canal du Nord line, 
which, as marshland and canal, was a formidable natural defence in itself. Every day Haig used to come to my headquarters and say, Be damned, Curry, do you think you could do it? He saw that if we could break the Hindenburg system, victory might come this year. With confidence born of long experience with the Canadian troops, I was able to give him my assurance each day. Yes, we will break it. Arthur Curry. Curry decided on an early morning attack, August the 26th, at three o'clock instead of the usual dawn hour. He felt, because of the high ground held by the Germans, there could be no element of surprise except for the hour of assault. This early start alarmed staff officers at GHQ, who were still wedded to the idea that attacks should commence at dawn. A representative of GHQ was sent to Curry's headquarters to express concern. Abrupt General Norman Ox Weber, Curry's chief of staff, confronted the representative. All we want from General Headquarters is a headline in the Daily Mail reading The Canadians in Monchi Before Breakfast. General Ox Weber. Indeed, the 3rd Canadian Division pierced the eastern slope of Orange Hill with its forward machine gun defences at dawn, and men of the 8th Canadian Infantry Brigade, in a brilliant encircling attack, secured the heights and captured the heavily defended town of Monchi just in time for breakfast. Additional stiff resistance was encountered at Jigsaw Wood and Vison Artois. It became increasingly clear that the DQ line would be heavily defended. By September the 1st, elements of eight new German divisions were already moving to reinforce the DQ line and Canal du Nord. The same day, Commander Haig received an ominous note from London stating that the War Cabinet would become anxious if we received heavy punishment in attacking the Hindenburg line without success. That night, Haig wrote in his diary, If my attack is successful, I will remain Commander-in-Chief. If we fail or our losses are excessive, I can hope for no mercy. Douglas Haig, once again, as at Passchendaele, found his future squarely in the hands of Canadian General Arthur Curry. The most challenging task before the Canadians was scaling the ridge of Mont Dury, where attacking forces would be in full view of the Germans and their murderous machine gun fire. Blocking the Canadians' path were four lines of heavily fortified zigzag pattern trenches. This defensive layout, Curry brilliantly grasped, could be used to his great advantage. Canadian troops would not make suicidal frontal attacks, but encircle in small raiding parties and flank the German trenches at their exposed ends. General Curry had discovered the key which would at last unlock the Hindenburg line. On September the 2nd, blessed with low-lying fog, which grew thicker as the day brightened, the Germans in the Drocourt trenches were at once encircled and then outflanked, and the effect was devastating. I understood, just in time, the strategy of the enemy, and advised the battalion and gathered all that was left around me and tried to stop them, but it was impossible opposite the masses of men that emerged from the fog. Soldier, 4th Company of the 121st German Infantry. The drocourt quayon line, as well as the support line, including the village of Dury, was captured according to programme that morning. Progress by the 1st Canadian Division in the afternoon resulted in the capture of the heavily wired Buissy switch line as far south as the outskirts of Buissy. This largely outflanked the enemy and compelled their retirement during the night behind the Canal du Nord. Arthur Curry General Curry had accomplished what no other commander on the Western Front had on the freshly reinforced and most staunchly defended section of the German line he had smashed a hole five miles wide through the Hindenburg line. The stunning victory, due to Curry's careful analysis of the fortifications, was a bold deviation from traditional frontal assault doctrine. But Arthur Curry's most audacious plan of the war lay just before him. The Canal du Nord what confronted Arthur Curry and the Canadians was no less than a 115-foot-wide canal, 18 feet deep, 
directly in front of the highest defended position of German-held territory, Berlin Wood. Logic dictated that even if the canal could be crossed, the strategic advantage of the high ground held by the Germans would annihilate any forces that survived the water crossing. After the breaking of the DQ line, Curry's forces were exhausted, and rightly so. Since August the 8th, they had been in continuous battle or on the march for hundreds of miles. Indeed, some Canadian divisions leaving the Amiens defensive had just reached Arras in time to go into battle. In 30 days, they had penetrated 26 and a half miles, had recovered 130 square miles of territory and liberated 47 towns and villages. It was time to pause, regroup and formulate a plan. The Canal du Nord was a formidable obstacle. Snaking its way through north-central France, it was bordered by impassable marshes on the eastern shore, as well as trenches and machine-gun posts running parallel to the waterway. The canal lay just west of the village of Bourlon and the heavily entrenched 100-metre heights of Bourlon Wood, where the Germans had a perfect view of advancing enemy troops. It was most probably the toughest natural defensive position on the entire Western Front. It would require a bold plan of attack with absolutely no room for error. Construction of the canal had been suspended at the beginning of the war and it only held water as far south as the lock near the Canadian core southern boundary. The dry section, 2,600 yards wide, across from the town of Marquion, would be the window of opportunity upon which Arthur Curry's greatest gamble of the war would rest. Curry extended his right flank to cover this dry section and his plan called for his engineer corps to be brought up, construct bridges and ladders and have guns, tanks, transport and 50,000 men cross the dry canal at this narrow opening under cover of darkness. Upon reaching the eastern shore, troops would fan out and make a turning movement to the north, overrunning the enemy's strong defences. It required flawless synchronisation between commanders and the highest state of discipline in advancing troops. If any piece of the plan broke down, it would be an unmitigated disaster. Upon reviewing the plan, Curry's superior, General Horn, became quite alarmed. Horn felt the turning movement too complicated and feared heavy losses if it was not executed in perfect order. Horn took the matter up with Commander Haig, who backed Curry. Unconvinced, General Horn tried one last manoeuvre. He called upon Curry's former commander and close friend, Julian Bing, to inspect Curry's plan. Bing no stranger to difficult troop manoeuvres, spoke to Curry quite directly and outlined the consequences of failure. Do you realise, General, that you are attempting one of the most difficult operations of the war? Curry acknowledged that he was. Well, if anyone can do it, the Canadians can do it, but if you fail, it means home for you. General Julian Bing There was no turning back. The stakes could not have been any higher personally for Arthur Curry. His very future rested upon the performance of his trusted Canadian Corps, which, he had come to believe, could meet any challenge, overcome any obstacle, and emerge ever victorious. Quite simply, this would have to be his and their finest hour. Failure would mean not only no future for Curry, but also the death of his beloved Canadian Corps. General Horne made Curry's plan official in written orders issued by First Army Headquarters on September the 22nd, 1918. The Canadians would be the spearhead once again for the British First Army. The British 22nd and 8th Corps would feign an attack to the north to draw the Germans' attention away from the crossing area until the Canadians had secured a foothold on the opposite side. Zero hour was set for 5.20 a.m. September the 27th. Once again, as at Amiens, there would be no preliminary bombardment. It would be a surprise dawn attack. If the least warning had filtered through the German higher command, we would have 50,000 of our people in the exposed forward area. Andy McNaughton A concentrated bombardment of this area prior to zero hour, particularly if gas was employed, would cause our operations total failure. Arthur Curry. All that was left now was to trust that no detail, no matter how small, 
had been overlooked. The men knew their task, the engineers were in place, and the artillery was ready. Night was broken by the myriad flashes of the guns in the artillery areas, followed by the pulsating flames of bursting shells over the enemy positions. Like the night of August the 7th at Bove Castle in front of Amiens, the opening barrage at Canal du Nord with no enemy counter-preparation is another unforgettable memory to me. It is a wonderful day for Canada and a terrible blow for the Germans. The end of the war is appreciatively closer. Andy McNaughton Under darkness and heavy smoke, Canadian troops descended the 18-foot canal walls down to the dry canal bed and scrambled up the other side. According to plan, upon reaching the embankment, they fanned out and secured their objectives. It was well into the morning before the Germans realised where the Canadians were coming from. By that time, however, most of the troops and heavy equipment were across. By 8pm, after very heavy fighting, Bourlon Wood, the formidable hilltop stronghold, had fallen. Curry's boldest gamble of the war had paid off magnificently, and now the Canadians were charging headlong past saint Ol towards the vital enemy-held supply town of Cambrai, where the Germans were dug in. The enemy had escalated the level of their resistance, and machine-gun fire was exacting a heavy toll. Although the Germans had mostly deserted Cambrai by 12.30 a.m., General von Marwitz had invoked a scorched-earth policy, leaving the city ablaze. The Canadian 3rd Division reached the outskirts by 9 a.m., encountering stiff rearguard machine-gun fire and pockets of resistance. By noon, the town was a scene of desolation of charred brick and smouldering timbers. Canadians picked their way through the haze of destruction, surveying the ruin. With the capture of Cambrai, the Allies had broken the will of the German army to continue to fight. Cambrai was taken without the loss of a single Canadian casualty. It was the ash heap of the hopes of a German victory lying, as Chaplain Renison recalled, at the boundary of abomination and desolation. Beyond Cambrai lay cornfields ploughed for next year's crops, which the Germans will not reap. Indeed, in the distance, the red tile roofs seemed to speak of a new experience. Cambrai was the gate, not only of a new country, but also of a new era. One could dream not only of relief of Belgium, but of humanity, healed of its wounds, a time of peace to come. Chaplain Renison From September the 23rd to October the 12th, the Canadians had advanced 30,000 yards, and 13 German divisions were met and defeated. On November the 1st, Valenciennes fell, and in the celebrations that followed, senior British officers refused the Canadians' request to be given pride of place in recognition of their role in recapturing the city. Irritated by what they saw as the Canadian officers' nationalist pretensions, the British dominated the victory ceremonies and ordered Arthur Curry to march at the back of the line. Nine days later, in Mons, Belgium, however, Arthur Curry would correct this slight. Following the success of the 3rd Canadian Division in liberating Mons, here, November the 11th, the final day of the Great War, General Curry himself ordered a victory parade led by the Canadians with representation from every unit in the Canadian Corps. Mons held great Allied significance. It was here four years earlier that British forces had suffered their very first defeat of World War I. It was a Canadian that had brought the war full circle. Epilogue In late August 1919, two months after Canada signed the Treaty of Peace as an independent nation, Arthur Curry stepped before the podium at Massey Hall in Toronto to recollect the last hundred days of the war. He confessed that he had no written words to guide him, but would trust, as he said, to the inspiration of the moment to carry him through. He spoke about the utter devastation of France and its people left homeless. He spoke about employment for his returning men who had fought so hard for the country and who would work just as hard at home. 
and then summed up his feelings about war. We picture war as a business of banners flying, men smiling, full of animation, guns belching forth and all that sort of thing. One somehow or other gets the impression that there is a great deal of glory and glamour about the battlefield. I never saw any of it. I want you to understand that war is simply the curse of butchery, and men who have gone through it, who have seen war stripped of all its trappings, are the last men that will want to see another war. Arthur Curry. I hope you've enjoyed this final episode. Thanks for listening. Be with us next week for a conversation with New York Times best-selling author Brad Taylor. We'll be discussing his new book, Dead Man's Hand, a Ukrainian Russian military thriller. I hope you can join us then. I'm Robert Child, and this has been Point of the Spear. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group.